happily complain for as long as you let me. Okay, so here we go. We're recording for the day. Um, I don't think I have too many announcements. Oh no, I have some announcements. You know what I should announce is, okay, so yay, recording. Here's all my emails. So you can go back and reread the starts to all my emails. Uh, let's see. Okay, here we go. Here's my first announcement for the day. During finals week, our scheduled final is for 8 a.m. on Tuesday the 18th from 8 to 10 p.m. It will be the same Zoom link that you all have currently found this morning, which is great. I know it, 8 a.m. Um, so I've got two things, two points to follow up on an 8 a.m. final. One, we have no final exam. Two, um, it will be nothing more than office hours. In case you need extra work, time to complete your course notes, or you have like last minute questions about your course notes or your tutorials or whatever, I will unfortunately be there from eight to 10, but I'll just be there um, available to answer questions. There is no final exam. Okay, good. Um, there's nothing I can do about the 8 a.m. Sorry, Shaheem. <laughs> I too am complaining about 8 a.m., but there's nothing I can do about it. So that's what we're going with. Hopefully the follow-ups that there is no final exam will help ease your mind a little bit. Do we have class during dead week or any videos? Yeah, I'm trying to minimize the content we have um, basically starting this week. So this week's gonna be some new content, but it shouldn't be too bad, I hope. And next week we are gonna introduce a new topic, but again, it shouldn't be too bad. That's my goal at least. Um, will we be learning stuff for the course notes during dead week? Yes, we will be learning some stuff for the course notes during dead week, but my goal is to make it not too stressful. Um, really this week and next week, I'm just trying to open your eyes to the world of statistics using the tools we have already built, uh, developed. So in fact, that's what this week is here to do. Um, I scrolled up to try to make sure I didn't miss any questions. It looks like I didn't miss any questions, but one just came in. Um, course notes are due the day of the final. Excellent. Thank you. That was my other point that I wanted to make. Indeed, the last um, time you can turn in course notes is like at 10 a.m. on Tuesday, May 18th. That's Pacific Daylight Time, UTC negative 7, Tuesday, May 18th, UTC negative 7, 8 a, uh, 10 a.m is the last time you can turn in course notes. Um, and you will submit them by uploading both the R Markdown and knitted HTML files for your tutorials, for both tutorials and your course notes. Submit both the R Markdown and HTML files to our shared Google Drive folder on Tuesday, May 18th at latest 10 a.m. Pacific Daylight Time, UTC negative seven. Uh, if you have images or plots or whatever, that you, extra images or plots that you've included, you will also need to upload those um, just the same. Labs are also due at the same time that your course notes and tutorials are due. Tuesday, May 18th, 10 a.m. Pacific Daylight Time, UTC negative seven. All course assignments should be submit by at latest. Tuesday, May 18th, 10 a.m. Pacific Daylight Time, UTC negative seven. I want both the R Markdown files and the knitted HTML files and any other plots or images that you have. Um, if you don't tar bomb me, I will accept tarred or zipped files. 
But in that case, if you have lots of files, lots of images, I would appreciate you to make a subfolder named images or plots or figures or something and put all of your plots in the subfolder. I do not want to be tar bombed in your Google Drive folder, please and thank you. But otherwise, yeah, I'm happy to work with tar files or zip files, but it's on you to make sure they, they work. Um, okay, other questions or comments before we get going into the last two weeks of the semester, which is really just my attempt to kind of open your eyes to the world of statistics as we have seen, uh, wait, not as we've seen it, to open your eyes to the world of statistics using the tools we have developed. Um, unfortunately, this class doesn't get too much to the um, statistical models side of thing, which is really the world of stats in front of you. But all of the tools we've developed at this point are going to leave you in an excellent standing to understand what these statistical models are all about. So I'm going to start in on a two week um, like introduction to statistical modeling, but it's not going to be so much about the direct application of it. Uh, applied statistics is really kind of like an art to be practiced and it takes practice. But uh, for the next two weeks, I'm just going to kind of show you how the tools we've developed will enable you to understand the framework within which the art of statistics is applied. Um, and oddly, it takes a lot of math to understand the art. So towards models is going to be the title for, oh God, I don't know what week we're in, whatever week this is of content. We're going to recap on the central limit theorem because that is like our main device to understand our uncertainty associated with a best guess of some expectation. I'm going to describe to you confidence intervals. I can't decide if we've mentioned those before or not, but anyway, I'm going to introduce them to you. That's probably where the majority of today's lecture is going to. Thanks, Hayes. Week 15 by my count, because I counted uh, spring break. The majority of today's lecture is probably going to focus on the confidence intervals section, because we've already looked at conditional density. So really all I'm going to try to do is show you how the central limit theorem is going to be easily joined in with um, conditional densities. And then once we put these two things together, hopefully the videos to come on Wednesday of this week should be super easy. But if we have like an extra five minutes at the end of class, which I'm trying to plan for, I will show you how you can minimize the content for the next two weeks ahead for the course notes. Brendan, whether or not you have 14 or 15 really depends on how you counted spring break or whether or not you messed something up. <laughs> Moving right along. Thanks for letting me ignore you. Let's do a quick recap of the central limit theorem. Okay, in the world of statistics, the central, it's actually a central limit theorem. There's multiple versions of it, but that's okay. The central limit theorem dictates the shape of the distribution for the sample mean. And the idea here is if you have capital N random variables from some distribution, let's just call it F and I'll give it a name in just a minute. And your random variables are independent, which remember means to find their joint density, you can multiply the densities together. This first I is for independent, which means to find their joint densities, you can multiply the densities together. 
And the next ID stands for identically distributed, meaning they all come from the same distribution. So if you have these random variables, then the mean of them is a new random variable. The way we are to think of functions of random variables is as a random variable itself. Now, the crazy part is, as long as we are dealing with a mean, then we know that this random variable, this singular quantity, is approximately distributed, normal. Uh, give me just a second to clean up my kind of workspace here. Is approximately distributed normally. Now, I haven't yet filled in the values for this normal distribution, but let's do that now. So if we have these random variables that all follow the same distribution, so they all have the same mean, that is the expectation of the random variable, which is really just crazy statistics notation for the identity function applied to some variable. If there is a mean named mu and a variance, I'll save us the obnoxious expectation of it, sigma squared, then the distribution of the sample mean here is approximately normal centered at the true population, at the true distribution's mean with a variance that now depends on how much data you have. Okay, so let's do a quick recap of all of this bottom line here. If you have capital N random variables and they come from some distribution, remember the central limit theorem does not care what distribution they come from. So long as there's a mean, call it mu, and so long as there's a variance, call it sigma squared, then by the central limit theorem, the mean of the random variables themselves. So this isn't saying the mean mu, but this is saying like the mean of the data. The mean of your data is a new random variable. If you simply add up all the data and divide by however many there are, that is a new random variable. And we know what shape that new random variable takes on by the central limit theorem. That new random variable is approximately normal, centered exactly where we want it to be, right at the true expectation that we're trying to estimate with a variance that depends on the sample size, with a variance that depends on how much data you have. This is really quite cool, in fact, because it says the more data you get, the skinnier and skinnier and skinnier this distribution here is going to be. And as soon as your sample size goes off to infinity, you will estimate the true expectation perfectly. As soon as the sample size goes off to infinity, once you have all the data that there is, you know exactly the true expectation. So that allows us to do something really cool. But now that I say that, maybe I'll stop and just ask if there's any questions before I move on. is me just trying to recap the central limit theorem. But if that doesn't quite click for anybody, please say so. And I can try to address where and when it stopped clicking appropriately. Are we all doing okay here? Oh, nice, some thumbs up. Good. Ah, Nathaniel, 
Excellent question. At what point do you consider the sample mean a good estimate of the true expectation? That is an age old question in the world of statistics with no good answer. And I'll tell you why there's no good answer and there probably will never be a good answer. Um, here, let me see if I can do this in R to better highlight why there's no good answer. Okay, so here we go. I'm gonna make up some data. Okay, so there's some data. Now, if you were quick enough to read the code that generated the data, then you know what the mean is. But that's not what happens in the real world. What happens in the real world is you never know what the true expectation is. All you have is data. So Nathaniel, this is why I'm, this is the reasoning for why there's no good answer to your question. In the real world, we are estimating a true expectation whose value we do not know. All we have is data to estimate that value. And so in this case, unless you already saw the code above, you don't necessarily know what the true expectation is, but here is an estimate of it. And so the question is, is that good? Well, we don't know if that's a good estimate because we don't know what the true expectation is. So we can't ask how far away is it? Because when you say how far away is it, you're asking how far away from the truth is it? And we don't know the truth. I hope that helps people see why there's no good answer to Nathaniel's first question. No, there is no good way to verify an estimate. There is no good way to verify an estimate. All we really know is that more data gets you closer and less data gets you further away. And worse is if somebody else took a different sample, they would get a different number. There's no good way to verify an estimate. And worse is if somebody took a different sample, they would get a different number. So all we really know based on the world of mathematics is that if you collect more data, you are going to be closer. And now I'm showing you what the true expectation is. It's 10.5. And you can see here, this was based on only 100 observations. And this one was based on 10,000. So indeed, we are now closer because we had more data. But with only one data set, there's no good way to say who is more accurate. That was a great question with a terrible answer, but unfortunately there is no good answer to that question. It was just a really good question. All we know is that with more data, you should be closer. The idea, oops, sorry. The idea comes down to this variance here. As your sample size increases, as you get more data, that variance will shrink. Look at the limit of that variance fraction. As the limit goes to, as the sample size n goes to infinity, that fraction is going to shrink and shrink and shrink. And you got to remember what smaller variance distributions look like. They look skinnier. And if they look skinnier, then we're concentrating on the true expectation. So let's see if I can draw you that picture. So we are working our way towards confidence intervals. Oops. Once I learn how to write, we will work our way to confidence intervals. We know that the sample mean
is approximately normal with a mean mu and a variance that depends on how much data we have. So we know that with, let's say, n equals 100, the distribution of the sample mean looks like this. It's centered at the right place, but all we have is one data set. So we don't know if we've shot over or under by just a little bit. So let me see if I can give you an example based on this. 10.04 would be just a little bit under. Let's go back to the example I just made up in R. And then let's go back and do one more estimate with a sample size of 100. 10.26. So it's like with two different data sets, we got numbers that looked like this. Is that clear enough to everybody? The distribution is really describing all the different sample means if you and like a thousand of your friends went out and each took your own sample of size 100 and each of you got your own sample mean. So you're each estimating the true expectation, 10.5, but you guys got different data, so you got different estimates. Is that clear to everyone? And this distribution here, which we denote with this notation, is representing what a thousand of you and your friends' different estimates would look like. Is that okay? Yeah, I can see it. Okay. So then getting towards, back to uh, Nathaniel's question, is if you increased your sample size to a thousand, you would then still have a normal distribution, but it would be a lot skinnier. It would still be centered around the same thing, the true value. But now you and your friends, all a thousand of you, each take, oh wait, what do I have? Hang on. Uh, oh, I did 10,000. So this is now like a thousand of you and your friends each got together and took 10,000 data points from this one distribution. And each of you now has your own data set and each of you gets your own mean, sample mean, estimating this 10.5. Well, because you now have 10,000 data points in your mean, you are more likely to be close to the true value you are more likely to be close to the true value when your sample size is much bigger. Is this still clicking okay with everyone? Okay, getting some thumbs up, up to three yeses. That's good. Please do say something if this isn't working for you because this is going to be the logic behind confidence intervals. Since we know what shape the sample mean has, we can then use percentiles or quantiles to come up with a range of most likely values for the true expectation. Okay, you ready? Say you took a sample of size 100 and you got the number 10.26. Because we know the shape of this distribution, we can then come up with a range of most likely values for the true expectation. 
And we call that range a confidence interval. Okay, let's try this again. If you took a sample of size 10,000, so now you have 10,000 data points. Yeah, definitely, Jake. So now you have 10,000 data points in that one variable named X. And you calculate the mean. We can trust that it's a good estimate, but we can also trust that it's basically wrong. But we can quantify how wrong that estimate is. Based on the central limit theorem, we know the shape of the distribution that describes our estimate of the true expectation known as the mean. Because we know from the central limit theorem, the shape, it's normal, of our estimate we can literally quantify kind of like the width of most likely values for the true expectation to live. We know this range will hold the most likely values for the true expectation to live. A single guess is almost guaranteed to be wrong, but we know the shape of this distribution. So we can stretch out from our best guess some amount to the left and some amount to the right and create this interval. And the interval is likely to capture the true expectation. Okay, so if I got, let's try one more time. I got a sample of 10,000 and I calculated 10.49, then I know I'm wrong, but I can extend some to the left and some to the right to create an interval of most likely values in which the true expectation will live. Since I know the shape of this quantity, I can use that information to calculate quantiles. So I can calculate this value here, and I can calculate this value here. And those will give me a lower and upper bound on my uh, distribution, such that I am some percent sure that the true expectation lives within that range. Okay, let's just draw one more picture and then we'll come back to it. Hey, there we go. Four normal distributions. We have a rule that tells us if we start at the mean and we go down one standard deviation and up one standard deviation, then we know within that range, there is approximately how much area? 68%. And I'm only taking that from the chat because somebody has already jumped to this conclusion. And if we go down from the mean to whoops, standard deviation and up from the mean to standard deviations, then we know there is approximately 95% of the area within two standard deviations of the mean. So we can use this information to calculate for us a range of value that are 95% likely to capture the true expectation. Okay, let's go back to this last picture. 
if we start with our best guess, 10.49, and then go up two standard deviations and down two standard deviations, we can create a 95% confidence interval that captures the true expectation. Let's see it in action. So here, we'll start at our best guess, mean of x. We will add two times. And now, look, this is the variance, but we want the standard deviation. So we'll just take the square root of this. Well, the square root of that is just sigma divided by the square root of however much data you have. So it's really just two times the standard deviation of our data divided by the square root of 10,000. That's the upper end and that's the lower end. But notice this range from 10.45 to 10.53 does indeed capture the true expectation. Okay, Jake, let me try to answer that question in just a second because it's a little bit more complicated than that. But I wanna make sure everybody at least gets to the idea that instead of coming up with a single estimate for an expectation, we are literally now coming up with a range of values. And the range of values is much more likely to capture the true expectation. So, we're gonna start using ranges for everything. And that's actually what happens in the world of statistics. Um, so do we have to do a 95%? No, honestly, 95% came from this one dude early in the 20th century who was like, well, if I was playing card games and I was you know, 95% sure that I was gonna win, then I would bet all my money on that. And seriously, because that one dude was like, I think 95% is good. Everybody has kind of followed suit. But if we wanted to be more confident, we could use a different confidence interval, a different percentage. But hey, it wouldn't be smaller. To be more confident, which way do you need to go? Out or in? To be more confident, which way do you need to go? Out? into the tails or in towards the mean? Since there's more area closer to the mean, wouldn't we want to go smaller? Ah, but what happens to that range? It shrinks, I know that. It shrinks, okay, so let's try this. Our best guess is 10.49. And what happens if we shrink this interval too much? We're not gonna capture the true expectation. Okay. I guess what I was so trying to say is that at some point, the further we go out, the less significance, you know, like as we get further and further out, yeah, we have more confidence, but at some point we've got like 99.9999%. And then does it really make sense to go a little bit further, I guess, is what I'm trying to say. But yeah, no, thank you. But let me try to give you the analogy in a different, um, a different light. If I wanted to be 100% sure that I guessed this, this true expectation that I've mm -hmm. highlighted here, if I want to be 100% sure, here's my interval. Negative infinity, <laughs> yeah. positive infinity. Thank you, right? Professor. Yep. Mm -hmm. So what we're trying to do is trade off confidence for precision. We're trying to trade off confidence for precision. So what we want to do is give up a little bit in the tails, like 2.5% on each side, but make the interval much more narrow, because narrower it's going to be, the more informative it's going to be. Okay, so that brings us to our next point. Let's just assume we have 95% kind of like as a fixed quantity. It's not the end all be all number, but let's just assume it's a fixed quantity. What is the only thing in this equation that we can change? What is the only thing in this expression that we can change 
that will make the interval more narrow. Assuming the 95% is fixed. What is the only thing that we can adjust here to make this interval more narrow? The sample size? The sample size, very good. The sample size is what controls the width of the confidence interval. The sample size is what controls the width of the confidence interval. The sample size is what largely determines the width of the confidence interval. And that's what brings us back to Nathaniel's question. When our sample size goes up, our confidence interval is gonna shrink and we can start being you know, more confident that we're doing something, we're getting towards the right expectation. Okay, so this is why I have been so stressing the fact that there's actually two different distributions going on here. There are two different distributions going on here. There's a distribution from which we sampled the data. There is a distribution from which we sampled the data. And the central limit theorem doesn't actually care what that looks like, but it doesn't have to be symmetric. And then there is a second distribution that tells us the shape of the sample mean. And that's the one we've been working with the most. Confidence intervals come from the central limit theorem, the shape of the sample mean. So I'm just trying to note these distributions to remind you that they are describing different random variables. I'm noting these distributions to remind you that they are describing different random variables. Okay, to make things even worse in the world of statistics, we often choose this distribution to be the normal distribution, even if it's not true. Okay, so I'm trying to build to the next step in this lecture. And what I'm telling you is this distribution here is often assumed to be the normal distribution, even if that assumption is false. Why? Well, it doesn't matter. If it's the normal distribution and your assumption is right, great. If your assumption that the distribution describing the original data is wrong, it doesn't really matter. The central limit theorem doesn't care what this distribution is. So you might as well assume it to be normal. I'm going to say that one more time. Oftentimes in practice, we assume the distribution that describes the original data as a normal distribution. And we don't care if that assumption is wrong. Why do we not care that the assumption is wrong? Because the central limit theorem tells us that the mean is going to look normal no matter what this original data distribution is. So even if our assumption about this being wrong, about this being normal is wrong, we don't care. The sample mean will look approximately normal anyway. Okay, here we go. Okay, the topic of this slide is going to be conditional densities, but I'm gonna lead into it with a non-conditional 
normal distribution. So I can highlight what conditional distributions are bringing to the table for us. Suppose we have a random variable y and it came from the normal distribution with a mean mu and a variance sigma squared. So now I'm thinking here that this is original data. So the variance is just sigma squared. The only time we have the divide by the number of data points is when we're talking about the sample mean. And when we're talking about the original data, we just say the variance is some value, let's call it sigma squared. Well, then the expectation of that distribution is mu. But here's the trick. This is just a placeholder. And I know students hate this because it's like a game with symbols that almost shouldn't work. So if it wasn't the mean and it wasn't named mu, we could name it something else. Somebody give me a letter. I am now naming the variable hj. It's just a symbol placeholder. Do you guys remember when you first started looking at functions and you're like, it doesn't matter if you name it X or Y, it's just the placeholder that takes the place of whatever thing is to be squared. This is just a placeholder. You can insert basically whatever you want right there. Okay, have I totally lost people? Did I lose you even more by, by replacing a single letter with a pair of letters? You all are named after a sequence of letters. The mean in the normal distribution is a placeholder. It doesn't matter what letter, what letter we choose. Well, this enables us to create conditional distributions which have conditional densities. So we can have y given x is equal to some value. And this thing can follow the normal distribution. Where the mean is now some variable that depends on x. Okay, here's where minds are gonna be blown. We can now define conditional distributions which have conditional densities. We can now define conditional distributions which have conditional densities. We can now define conditional distributions, random variables given some other random variable related to y takes on some value x, just emphasizing my x's here, difference from capital letters, random variables, and lowercase letters, specific values. We can now define conditional distributions. The random variable y given x, the random variable takes on some specific value is normally distributed. And think of this as like a line Uh, that's beta one times X. Think of this expression as a line. There's an intercept and a slope. But in the world of statistics, they don't choose, um, you know, MX plus B. They choose beta naught and beta one because they have to be different, I guess. I don't know why. Think of it as a line where the intercept is beta naught plus some slope times a new value. So 
it's not a one, it's an I. No, this is a one. This is a zero and this is a one. I'm just giving subscripts to the betas to differentiate them. Zero is the slope and one, I mean, zero is the intercept and one is the slope. Okay, so what's blowing your mind now is that this is the mean of the distribution. This is the expectation. This is the new expectation and the new expectation depends on the value little x. Is that not blowing your mind? Is that just like, yeah, cool, I can deal with that. The slope plus the y-intercept is your new mean, bingo. The slope, beta one, times some value of x plus beta naught is the new mean. Is that relationship always linear, professor? No, that's an amazing question. Oh my God, that question alone is, is fantastic. Okay, so this is getting like way ahead of ourselves. And I'm just gonna leave this because that question was amazing. And this is a new word, but you don't have to totally know what it means. The world I'm explaining to you all can describe things like this, where this is obviously a non-linear function. And so if you had a bunch of data like this, you could fit a curved line through it with the model I'm giving you here. Kristen, that was an amazing question. This answer is super general because your question was awesome. If this doesn't immediately make sense to you and you want to spend some time looking at it later on, I am literally just saying the mean is a placeholder. You can put whatever you want here. Previously, I put a linear function, but you can put whatever function you want right here. The mean can be an equation that depends on another variable. The world of statistics is now relating variables. The world of statistics is now relating variables X to variables Y based only on data. The world of statistics is now relating to us. Two or more variables. and we're doing it through data. So conditional densities is allowing us to relate to or more variables. And the central limit theorem is literally quantifying uncertainty in our estimates of the relationship between the variables. Okay, one more time. Conditional densities allow us to relate two or more variables. We specify the relationship. That's what I want to say. We specify the relationship between two or more variables. And the central limit theorem literally quantifies our uncertainty. We create that interval range that is um, telling us the range of most likely values for the true expectation to live. But now it's a true expectation of the relationship between the variables. We are literally now creating a confidence interval, a range of values in which the most likely values of that expectation, which now describes a relationship between two or more variables, lives. We now know the range in which that expectation lives. And the expectation itself is describing the relationship between two or more variables. 
this is what statistical modeling is all about. We can estimate relationships between variables based on only data. We can estimate relationships like this between two or more variables based on only data. I blew through 1050. I thought I saw 1050 coming, but it's already 1051. So I'm going to stop recording here. I'll happily stick around and answer questions if you want me to.